Hi there, everyone. Thank God that you could again make time out of your day to join us here at Westwood Hills Christian Church. Let us begin as we usually do by reading and sharing God's holy word. We'll start with Proverbs chapter two, verses one through five. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commandments. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. Mark chapter four, verse 24. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. Finally, James chapter one, verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. May God Almighty deliver blessings both upon the reading and the hearing of his precious and holy word. And now family, we're gonna pass the baton over to Fullerton, California, there at Hope International University, where we will be joined by our dear brother and pastor, Joe McCarthy. It's all yours, brother Joe. Well, hey, thank you so much for tuning in. Here we are, uh, you know, live is a whole different thing these days. It says live in our video, but we are not even in person. We are alive, but we're not together in person. But I'm very pleased uh, to have the honor and the privilege to spend a few moments here with Dr. Joe Grana. Dr. Joe, for many years, um, was the Dean of the um, Pacific Christian College of Ministry and Biblical Studies at Hope International University, a uh, beloved professor. In fact, he was given this nickname, the Pope of Hope, after many years on campus, which I just love. I think it's hilarious, and it's a very definitely a term of endearment. Uh, Joe has retired from the full-time role and is now supporting the president and reaching out to alumni, and I know he's doing stuff in churches, both in California and Arizona. But Joe, would you take a minute just to greet the folks and let us know both what you're up to now and your history with Westwood Hills Christian Church? Sure. Thank you, Joe. So, so good to be with you. It's just a real privilege to be able to come and share. And uh, you, know, you talk about the Pope of Hope. There's 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 two reasons for that. One is because uh, I was the old guy, you know, and all the popes are old guys. And the other is, is uh, I'm Italian. You know, my, my dad actually was born in Palermo, Sicily, so Sicilian technically. And uh, so that that's kind of the connection. Uh, the Italian background and, and the age makes one Pope of Hope when you've been there for, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, I, they gave me that name for a while. I didn't know it. I guess it was a few years old until finally somebody, you know, kind of let, leaked it out. And then I said, oh, really? And it was kind of fun. <laughs> That's uh, great. Anyway, uh, yes, I've uh, been in California now for 41 years. I was pastor of First Christian Church of Downey. And while I was there, I started uh, serving at Hope. <clears throat> which was Pacific Christian College at the time and uh, was professor of, of, of preaching. And so uh, I carried that responsibility for three and a half years, doing both of them full time, and then uh, became a little bit too much. And one of the ways I knew that is that I'm a whistler and I realized I wasn't whistling anymore. Right. Uh, That's I right. There's something, there's something wrong here. I guess I'm a little worn out. And so I resigned from the church and became full-time alone at, at the school. And then have been had a privilege for through the years to do a number of interim ministries, about 16 of them. I don't know, I've lost track. I don't keep count of it all, but about that many and planted a church out in Temecula. And I've had the opportunity to be at Westwood Christian Church uh, for a number of years, uh, both preaching and then scheduling preachers as well. And even had a little bit of uh, connection with, with you becoming a part of uh, the, the preaching uh, pastor of the church. So it, yeah. it, it's, it's been good. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, I don't know if you remember this, Joe, but about, it was probably four or five years ago when Westwood Hills uh, was looking for a preacher just for a Sunday or two that uh, you recommended me. And I went out and met James and Melanie for the first time. I preached two weekends in a row and then years went by and I didn't give it too much thought after that uh, until now it's been about a year and a half ago that 
Westwood Hills came back to the university and said, hey, could you guys recommend somebody to fill in the pulpit for a while? And I wasn't in in that meeting, but I got to tell you how grateful I am that whoever made that decision said, well, why don't you talk to Joe? I think Joe would like to do that. This Joe, not that Joe. <laughs> and and uh, what I thought was going to be a two or three month assignment has turned out to be a, a wonderful opportunity for me to continue to hone my skills as a communicator, to share what God has on my heart, uh, to make connections both with people in the church and through the internet, uh, potentially around the globe. And so it's been uh, it's been a transformative experience for me. So thank you, Joe, for your participation in that decision making. Well, I'm very happy to do that. I enjoy watching you on occasion uh, online. Right on. So, Joe, um, I'm again. I, I consider it a great privilege to talk to you, especially in in this format, because to me, you are a, a guide and a role model and someone I really admire and respect, both professionally and personally. Uh, and so, this is really this is a great privilege for. From Joe, this Joe, um, and thank you for your being, being willing to to share your ideas. In fact, share is kind of the key word of the day. So I gave you a little background here, but uh, I found from time to time, for reasons I don't completely understand, God often reveals things to me in a five-letter acronym. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to compile these because I see this pattern emerging. And one that came to me just last week is the word share, S H A R E, and um, I was driving to the campus, which you've been there a zillion times, and as I'm pulling into the parking lot, I just sense God's presence there, and, and the word share is clear as day in my mind, and I think, okay, here it comes. I, I don't know what it is, but here it comes. And within moments, uh, it fleshed out in my mind, and so actually I was going into the gym to do the morning basketball that you, you used to play years ago. And, and they have this little break after the first game. We have a little devotional time, and so I said, Hey guys, I have a word, right? And so I, I did. I just fleshed out the share acronym, which I just got in the car five minutes before, and people are like, "Thank you, Joe. That was really good, right?" So I started writing this stuff down, and then I thought, you know, I, the word share alone makes it clear I'm not supposed to keep it to myself, right? The, the word indicates share this, Joe. Share. So I start sending it out to people who I know and love and trust, and trying to get their input and their thoughts. And you are one of those people, uh, and so I want to walk through that acronym with you and get. You know, here, I'll tell people what I got out of each letter, but I, I want you to help me flesh that and go dig deep into each one and see how does this really apply to our Christian life? How is it grounded in biblical principles? How do you see the truth of God's word revealing itself through this acronym so that it can become both practical and useful to those who might tune in? Does that sound good to you? Sounds good to me. Right. Um, and just even that idea of share before we go on, I should just say, you know, I've got this Cubs shirt on. I decided to be very really casual. Some of you folks are probably Dodger fans, Angel fans. Angel is my American League team, uh, but I've been a diehard Cub fan all my life. Grew up in Chicago. So uh, I hope that's not a stumbling block to some. I hope it's an endearment to others. Uh, it shows my perseverance. So I've endured all my life until uh, they got the World Series. And so I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> okay, well, since since we're sharing about the Cubs, first I got to ask you: Does Cub is Cubs an acronym for anything? Uh, not that I know. Of, no. <laughs> All right. So, but in terms of sharing, there's this magical, beautiful moment uh, when the Cubs did go to the World Series after this lifetime of being suffering as a fan of the Cubs. Uh, Could yeah. you tell people kind of the short version of what happened there? Well, it, it was it was really dramatic. It was a very emotional event for me. <laughs> I, I've known the Cubs longer than I've known Jesus, and that I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't raised in Christ. I was raised as a Cub. My great uncle pitched in the Cubs farm system, so my grandpa was a big Cub fan and instilled that in me. But that all happened before I ever came to Christ. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, Jesus has kind of superseded the, the, the Cubs by a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that that's kind of... What, what has happened was my background there. And uh, I, I I have persevered through the years, and it was very, very uh, emotional for me <clears throat> for the Cubs to make it. And then I thought at game seven, when it got tied up, I thought, well, here go the Cubs are going to blow again like they have for the last 108 years. And then there was a rain delay. And then I thought this could go on for two days. Who knows? It was 17 minutes. They came back and won the game. It was It was phenomenal. Uh, I did have the great privilege from some students that uh, uh, did a GoFundMe for me. 
so that I could go back to Chicago and go to the game. So the first game I was at, I was just outside the stadium because I didn't have a ticket. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the second game I went to, and then the third game I got another ticket, and that's when they won the game. The only game they have won in the World Series in Chicago uh, since 1945. So that was pretty dramatic, and uh, it was really fun to be there. And the Cubs have a tradition that when they win a game, the, the, the fans sing a song, Go Cubs Go. And, uh, you know, I won't sing it for you, but to, to be in that stadium when everybody is singing, thousands of people singing that, it was really a very uh, almost spiritual event. You know, only worship was greater than that, uh, but that was a great event and great time. Yeah, that's fantastic. I don't know if you've seen it, Joe, but ESPN once did a segment, kind of a longer segment about the parallels between college football at the highest level and church. And they just talked about the building and the crowd and the songs and the energy and rooting for something outside yourself and all these great parallels. And I don't think they were trying to make any point. They were just showing the, the comparison. And I was, my heart was beaming. I'm like, that is what church can be and should yeah. be. Should be. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I've heard, I, I would think if we were fully tapped into the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and offers us new life, we're not going to sit in church and go, oh, that's nice. We're going to go, woohoo! <laughs> right? Yeah. And the sad thing is, you know, that when, uh, when somebody does that in a game, they're a great fan, but if somebody does that in church and they're a fanatic, you know, they're sure. meaning they're kind of weird. And we should get more excited about uh, Jesus' victory than any sports team victory. Yeah. Couldn't sure. agree more. Couldn't agree more. That'll be a, another topic for another day about being a Jesus yeah. fan, right? Exactly. <laughs> I love that. All right. So let's, uh, let's move into this acronym, SHARE. Uh, I have a word for each letter, and I want to hear your take. First, I'll cover the five, and then we'll go back one by one. So I have S for show, H for hear, A for ask, R, reflect, E, explain. And I have a little bit more in each one. Um, where this comes from, Joe, and for those who are listening, is that um, I see so much division in our culture. Everybody does. It's It's obvious. Uh, and I know that breaks the heart of God because his mission is reconciliation, right? And so the world's going away from each other and away from their, even their true selves, all these splinters everywhere you look. And, and on social media in particular, people aren't talking to each other. They're talking at each other or worse, they're talking over each other and nobody can hear anything because we all know the louder you yell, the less you can hear, especially when you're on the receiving end. So I really think this idea of share digs deep into a lot of what Jesus tells us about community and about relationships. And uh, I really love that model that the things that we want the most are the things if we give them away, they'll come back to us in spades, give and you shall receive, all of that. So that in that context, then this word comes up, the share. And the first S, the S stands for show. And I put show up, be fully present, bring your A game. What, what comes to mind there for you, Joe? What comes to my mind, uh, Joe, is that when you're engaging with someone, if we're having a dialogue with somebody, that your your mind and your heart and your attention is with that person in, at that moment. Uh, that's one of the things that I think was always true of Jesus. Jesus was with the people he was with. He wasn't thinking of the next person, the next appointment. He wasn't thinking about where he's going next. He's thinking about this person at this time giving full attention. And that I think is is something that shows respect to, to the other person. It gives them worth. It gives them feel like, well, you know, somebody's actually listening to me because they're they're with me. Uh, and the rest of your acronym goes along with that. It expands upon that thought. And I think that's what we need to do with people because well often you find the case they, somebody might act like they're listening, but they're not really listening. What they're doing it's thinking about what they're going to say. Right. So yeah. they don't actually hear. And what, what, what I have found humorous and sad when I've been observing a couple people going back and forth, and I'm saying they're arguing, but they're saying the same thing. Right. But they're not listening to each other, so they don't know that they're saying the same thing because neither one is hearing the other person. Yeah, all the irony. They're actually in agreement, but they're arguing about the yeah. same thing on the same side. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's where it's right? Yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, so for, for me, showing up, uh, bringing your A game, this is like a, a mindset where 
if I'm going to engage in a conversation either as a leader, as a friend, as a husband, as a dad, um, I can't just fake my way through it, right? I can't just uh, sort of be half-hearted about it because I will communicate to the other person. That's kind of how I feel about you, kind of half-hearted, right? right? And like you said, Jesus never did that. Jesus was fully present. And I, I like the scripture even here that says that he's our ever-present help in time of trouble, right? So when we're in distress, he's present. He's He's nowhere else. He's right here, right now with me, right? Yeah. So the uh, H is stands for here. This is the active listening part. Listen carefully before speaking. Right. Where, where does that where does that take you, Joe? Well, active listening involves hearing. And it's not only the words that are said, but the meaning and the feeling behind it. So you have active listening and you have empathic listening. Empathic is where you're actually getting to the emotional part, not just the intellectual part. And you want to do both. There's got to, in communication, there's an intellectual part of communication. There's an emotional part of it as well. And uh, active listening will help you definitely with the intellectual, empathic, gets you at the emotional where somebody's expressing their feelings. Absolutely. Yeah. I, th I think this ties into the mind and the heart that God gives us in yeah. his image, right? The mind is, I know what you're saying. I understand, right? And that does require active listening because you can't even understand what someone's saying if you're not paying attention. Right. Yeah. But the heart is means this is a knowing where it's the deeper, like a sense I'm experiencing what you're saying. I'm not just hearing the words. I understand the words. But now I feel, like you said, I feel what you feel. Uh, and what people really want, I've heard this stated, and I, is this idea of they want to feel felt. Yes, they want to be understood, but they also want to feel felt. And I, and I love that God's given us both a mind and a heart so that we can hear and understand, and then we can empathize, as you said, and help people feel felt, because that's pretty powerful. Well, it's extremely powerful, and that's where a real connection comes in. Uh, one, one example I think of, you know, it was helpful to me to find out that anger is a secondary emotion. Someone is angry because they're embarrassed, they're frustrated, they're in grief, uh, whatever, and any number of initial feelings. And so it's often we want to just deal with the anger and shut it down without really getting at what's behind it. Oh, I, I sense you feel very frustrated. I sense that you are at a loss. I, I sense that you are feeling that you're all alone. What, what, whatever is the primary emotion behind it is, is really an important aspect of really listening, showing up, and hearing the other person. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really good. Um, I like to say it this way sometimes. You listen to the words, but you feel the music behind the words. Yeah. Because the words are the notes, but the music is the symphony of their life. So the words are the context, or the content that's coming out in this context of a life. So listen to the words, but feel the music behind the words. Yeah. Uh, the A, then you've already led into this one because it, it does all tie together. Ask, right. ask, clarifying, clarifying, ask clarifying questions. This, again, goes to the idea of seek to understand first before you want to be understood. What, and the question I like is, what can I learn? Not just what are you saying, but what can I learn? This might be an expressed overt question or it might just be the mentality that you have. You're in here to learn. And this also suspends judgment, right? So you're not assuming that you know where the other person's coming from what their motives are, you know, it's, it's curiosity, as I've heard, is the cure for judgment. Well, let me hitchhike on that, because I think that's a really important point, because when someone starts speaking, so often we can think of the argument against what they're talking about without giving them a chance to actually say it. You know, so some of the reasons that we, we don't hear is because we don't pause long enough, we don't listen long enough to really hear what they say. We jump to a conclusion too soon. And that conclusion may or may not be right. And when it's not right, it just shuts down the communication with the other person. So, well, they're not listening to me. And then they either get more angry or they, they just clam up and don't right. share anymore. At the very least, they assume that you just don't care, right? Yeah. You, say, you say you do, you're there, but you, if you're not listening, if you're not asking questions, you don't really care. I think questions are a gift, really. It's a gift that says, I want to understand you, right? Not I, not I want to tell you what I think. Yeah, yes. And, you know, sometimes some people are maybe kind of like me when it comes to talking about emotions and that it takes me a while to get there. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I don't necessarily come right out with what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. I have to kind of set the scene and give the background. And if somebody doesn't uh, give me a chance to do that, I never get to that final point. And so sometimes we just got to wait, wait, wait. Until then, we say, oh, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, there's that great verse in the Bible that says, ask, seek, and knock. You know, ask and you shall find, or ask, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be open. But you know this already. The, the language, that's the interpretation of the original language. But the verbs in that original language are, they're continuous verbs, continuous right. present. Ask and keep on asking. Exactly. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. So this is not only in our relationship with God, but I think God's given us a model for how we connect with each other. This is about connection. We ask and we keep on asking because, as you said, most of us don't give the deep answer from the first question because we're testing the waters to see, do you really care, yeah. right? Or do you right. have anything to offer? So often it's like question six or seven where you get past all of the veneer and all the protections and all the walls and all the you know exactly. can, I, can i really show you myself well by question six or seven i'm pretty sure you do want to know yeah so be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to anger james tells us Boom. yeah uh, abraham lincoln is quoted as saying and uh, god gave us two ears and one mouth and so he wanted us to listen twice as much as what we talk i love it I love wisdom it. in that uh, seriously. Yeah. So show up here. Listen carefully. Ask clarifying questions. The R then is reflect. And I wrote contemplate what you observe and you experience. So that's both what you understand and what you feel. Then reflect on that. And I see reflection in kind of a two way street. You reflect on how am I receiving this? So what's my interpretation? But then as a good therapist, counselor, friend, you reflect that back to the person that's giving you this gift and say, is this what you're communicating? Because here's what I'm hearing, but I my radar might be off or my interpretation may be way off. So is this what you're saying? Here's what I hear you saying. What are you really saying? And that that both, I mean, you can you, go ahead, go, on, go off of that right there. Yeah, exactly. Because that keeps you from judging as also until you know, until you understand then you can maybe make an evaluation or whatever. But but until you know that you've actually heard the person, uh, you, you need to do exactly what you've said. So I, I think that's a great point. You know, my wife often tells me, because I'm a guy and I'm a fixer, like we often are, especially in our marriages, Joe, I, I don't want you to tell me your answers. I don't want you to fix it. I'm not looking for advice. I just want you to be here and feel what I'm feeling, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not a feeler though. You know, I'm a thinker. I'm a, I'm a solver. I'm a, I'm a guy. Right? Right, right. She's like, just, just hang with me, and and don't try to solve anything. Don't jump to any conclusions. Just listen carefully to what I'm saying. And if I feel that you're feeling what I'm feeling, that's all I need. You know, yeah. that just doesn't compute. I don't get that. But okay, I, I believe her, right? Yeah, and, and I think there, even, even some men want that as well, even though they don't know that they want that. <laughs> it is to really give the chance to uh, just say what it is. And sometimes by giving the, the, the listening ear and doing the things that we've just talked about, people can come to their own conclusions and their understanding as they articulate. They go, oh, all right, now I understand within myself where, where I'm at and what I need to do. Yes. Oh, you really you tapped onto something I hadn't even thought of until right now, Joe, and that's the power of words, right? And so we often, as guys in particular, okay, me, I'll just make it me. I come in like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to analyze, evaluate, and I'm going to give you a solution, right? That's not what my wife's asking for. But I think a better, a much better place to come is to believe going into the conversation that the person I'm talking to knows the answer. They just need to reveal it. And how do they reveal it? By talking it through. So maybe it's not in their mind yet, or but God's God's spirit's in them just as much as it's in me, right? It's everywhere. So I, I don't have to be the answer guy. I just be the question guy. And if I ask better questions, I get better answers. And as you said, and I've seen this over and over again, the really most effective coaches, therapists, uh, pastors, teachers are the ones that ask the provocative questions where people have to dig deep to find out, oh, that's what I think. That's what I feel. That's what I believe. And as you and I both know, once it comes from them, you can't talk them out of it, right? I can talk you into something, but I can't talk you out of what you've decided. Yeah, that's right. And and then if somebody comes to their own understanding, 
they're going to they're going to own it and they're more likely to do something than if I tell them to do something. Exactly. Yeah. Now, they, they may comply. And then if it doesn't work, whose fault is it becomes my fault for telling them to do that? That's right. You and your bad advice. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I've heard that a few times. Uh, more times than I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's good. That's really good. So many levels. And and I, I do want to tie this into my relationship with God and you as well, that I've even found times when I was in the deepest pain or trauma or the questions or the angst, uh, depression or anxiety, that I prayed to God for answers. And sometimes he'll give me an answer, but oftentimes he'll just say, I'm here. Right. God's modeling this for me as well. Yeah, yeah. God's saying, I know you're looking for answers and they will come. But the most important thing is your relationship with me. And I am here. I see you. I feel you. I hear you. Uh, but I'm not going to solve it for you because I want you to grow your spiritual muscles and become the kind of person that understands that in my relationship with Christ, abiding with Christ or in Christ, that's where the answers lie. It's not like a, you know, a vending machine where I put in the quarter and expect a solution. Yeah, and that can give you peace if you can get to that point. Because then even though it's not resolved, you have a peace because you know God is with you, he's for you, he's in you. I think of the title of a book, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick on prayer. And it's uh, his point is not that God so much give me as God make me. And, and by make, he means make me into the kind of person, make make me to, to understand rather than doing it for me, help me to be in a, such a way that I can do it uh, with, with your assistance, your help, because God's involved in it. But he wants us to take some responsibility here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think this goes to Paul's letters where he says, you know, you've been drinking the milk of the word like a little baby. When you come to Christ, you are a little baby. You're, you're born again. That's that's Jesus' words. But Paul's encouraging us, don't stay a baby, right? Wean right. yourself from the, the easy stuff, the low-hanging fruit, and start digging into the deeper stuff. And I think that's too God saying, I mean, look around. He made a creation where things grow, or if they don't, they die. So I think God's asking us to grow. Well, we grow through struggle. We grow through pain. We go through trial and error, right? We don't grow through someone just doing everything for us. Right. Yeah, we need to do it. And God wants us to do. Yeah. I've even heard uh, one of my friends, Lee, say that he, he really believes that God uh, um, empowers us and leads us to do these things so that when heaven reveals itself, Whatever that looks like, we don't really know. But there are indications of the Bible that we'll have responsibilities. Like he's going to give us to him much is given, much will be required. And there'll be things in heaven for us to do. And so he's preparing us even for that. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, the whole idea of heaven floating on a cloud, uh, playing the harp, or even an eternal church service. <sighs> I, I don't see, I think that. Heaven's going to be active. It's going to be learning. It's going to be growing. It's going to be doing. It's going to be fun in that sense. It's going to be fulfilling. And it's just going to be in total love, an environment of, of love from God and love for one another. It's, it's going to be pretty awesome. Awesome. I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the, the depths of, the, uh, of our world and even the universe. I think there's just so much to see that God has created. I mean, he, he's got to enjoy all the things that he has made. And he's going to share that with us somehow, some way. I don't know yeah. what it would be like. Yeah. And in fact, the Bible makes it clear that God created these things for us to enjoy. These are his yeah. gifts to us. And since God's infinite and unlimited and eternal, that means we're not going to run out of things to do in heaven, right? <laughs> That's right. right. All right. Let's move on uh, to E. So we've talked about show up here, which is active listening, ask clarifying questions, reflect which is that learning by reflecting and then giving it back to somebody. And then E is explain. And I, I love that as this acronym developed in my heart and my mind, that the E part, which is the speaking part, sharing, you know, what, whatever I think is the very last thing in this five letter acronym. Yes. I don't start, I don't start with explaining, right? That's the very last step. And I wrote explain. So speak, but speak to serve. That's your intention. I'm not speaking to solve. I'm speaking to serve. Words create worlds. We know that because the Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was God, and he spoke creation into existence. So there's something about that in me, right? Words create worlds. So use your words 
not to destroy, because I mean, the Bible is clear. You can use your words for life or death. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned, right? Power of life and death is in the tongue. So I'm saying with all the chaos and the shootings and the nasty wars and that's going on in this world, let's use our words as weapons of mass construction. What do you think, yeah. Joe? Yeah, I, no, I, I love that. I think that's that's exactly where, where it is. And that uh, it, it's okay eventually to share your opinion as your opinion, but not as your directive. Yeah. I think is what you're saying. I am. Uh, but all that is based upon totally understanding where the other person is. And then, and so, you know, some people say, well, are you just saying, well, I shouldn't give my opinion or whatever? And I'm not saying that, but there's a time for that. And the time for it is is later rather than sooner. Yeah. And so that you go through the process. And therefore, you can have an informed opinion rather than uh, a, a jump to opinion. Yeah. And I do think, too, that uh, one of the keys of the explaining, the E, is humility, because there are things that I'm pretty sure about. It doesn't mean I'm right. Right. And my friends often say, Joe, are you sure? Because I'll speak with this great, great sense of authority. Are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. And then they go, are you right? I'm like, I don't really know. I have no <laughs> idea. But I, I, I think there's this great combination here that oftentimes we are really sure about what we think we know we know. And then new information comes. We're like, oh, I was way off there, right? Right. Exactly. Wait, what? You know? And so to have that mindset, I mean, even the Apostle Paul, I talked about this a few weeks ago, Apostle Paul, he's persecuting the Christians because he believes. He, he's doing what's right. Yeah, he believes he's defending the faith, right? He's yeah. doing he's doing God's work by slaying the Christians. He didn't, because he didn't know what he didn't know. And God's like, um, let me give you another perspective. Boop, kicks him off the horse, you know, and suddenly he's humble because he's blind. He needs help getting even to the house of a guy he would have killed just days before. Yeah. And then God takes the scales from his eyes. I love that metaphor because it's like the truth was there. I just couldn't see it. So God's peeling the layers away to say the layers of your tradition, the layers of what you think is right, the layers of, you know, all of your interpretation. Let me peel some of that way so you can see clear what's really going on. Yeah. You know, we're all on a journey. We're all sojourners here, and nobody's got it all together. You know, so many times people want to put God in a box and say, okay, now I've got it, it all figured out. Or even I have this particular text all figured out in the Bible. And God just keeps blowing that up for me anyway. I thought I knew what that said, but I didn't know what it said. Let me give you very quickly an example. Please, uh, yes. Isaiah 55, it says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And the initial thinking is, well, yeah, of course not. God's God, and therefore I don't think his way, I don't do things his way. And, and that's true, but that's not exactly what that text is talking about, because in the context it says God is rich in showing mercy, and mercy to the ungodly. So what he's talking about is God's way of showing mercy is greater than ours. His thoughts about mercy are greater than ours. We, He is much more willing to forgive us and to forgive others than we are to forgive others and then particularly to forgive ourselves. Yes, so true. Wow, that's good in the context of mercy. So this is really good. You just gave us the content, which we thought we understood, and you put it in a new context. And I see this dichotomy, this dual uh, reality a lot, Joe, and I'd love to get your take on this, that content from God's perspective is his truth. He is, right? He's the ever-present, no, same yesterday, today, and forever. But I'm in a context that's constantly changing. I'm bound by time and space. God's outside of that, right? He created it. So he's looking in from the outside. But he's always present. He's our ever-present help in time of trouble. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's all present for him. It's all right now. But my context is ever-changing. So I even think that when a scripture comes to me that really is helpful and it gives me a revelation about who God is and who I am and how to relate to somebody in that moment, it's beautiful and it's true, even if it's a really weak interpretation or it's a limited interpretation. And then life changes, right? And I come back around, I see that scripture again, and suddenly it means something different or richer or deeper or it applies differently. And I'm like, whoa, I never saw it that way before. And that's because the truth doesn't change. I change. The context, the world is spinning through space, hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. Everything changes all the time, whether we perceive it or not. But God's truth is a constant. So he's like, Keep bumping up your context into my content, and I'll give you truth for the now, because I am the God of the now. Yeah, and that, that's why a text means something to you today 
And five years from now, it may mean something else. I mean, it's still the same concept and all, but the application of it becomes different because our life situation is different. Yeah. And I also think there's a great principle that helps us, can help us if we let it, to quit being so divisive, even within the church, right? Because oftentimes these divisions of the church is my interpretation of the scripture versus yours. I'm right, you're wrong. Well, so, as soon as you make that equation, I'm right, you're wrong, we both lose, right? right? So so what about God is infinite and he's limitless and this is his word, which actually is Jesus, is the word. So what are the chances that it might mean something to me? It's like three pieces of the puzzle and the puzzle has 7.5 billion pieces, which is a pr for every one of us on the planet, and uh -huh. you've got a different piece or three pieces and maybe we're both right, Right. Yeah, ex exactly. And a lot of people can't can't see that because they say, well, there's a right and there's a wrong. Often that is not the case. Yeah. Uh, and I've used a, an imagery when my teaching talk about theology is of what I call hovering. And so it's kind of like you hover, you can have the image of a helicopter or of a rocket ship, a spaceship that's hovering over the landscape. And this is what I believe right now. Now I'm hovering to look at the rest of the landscape to see what other views there are. And I, I may choose to go right back where I was, but it may be that I gained some new insight because I've looked beyond where I've been. It's like, oh, that makes some sense. Maybe yeah. I need to move over there. And you, you can't stay up there forever because it's too tiring and it's too difficult. And so you, you land for today, but hopefully that's not your final point of landing. You know, eventually you, when you have the energy, the interest and such, you get up and you hover again. And then you take a look at the landscape again and, and see where uh, God might be leading you. Man, I love that. That's such a great idea. Hover. It, it gives us the bird's eye view, or you could even say a little bit closer to the God's eye view because God yeah. sees it all. We yeah. get to see a little bit more. And, and it's so important that uh, Brene Brown, who's a fantastic, brilliant person that talks a lot about uh, vulnerability and, and how to make human connections, she says she's throwing all of her research out because she was saying, for many years, walk a mile in another person's shoes to understand where they're coming from. And she's even realizing, well, that's actually quite impossible because there's no way I can understand all the things that make up who you are and what you're going through. And she says, on the surface, we present very few emotions. You know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mad. That's kind of like what it all comes down to. And so if that's what you tell me, well, I'm going to interpret that from my context and I'm going to decide what that means. But if I can ask these questions, right, if I can, if I can do this share acronym if i can remember to show up fully present bring in all all my best stuff and i hear i'm listening carefully not just to the words but to the music behind the words you know the thoughts and the emotions and i'm asking clarifying questions believing that the first answer is probably not the answer is certainly not the full answer okay. so i care enough to ask follow-up questions clarifying questions uh, to suspend judgment right and then i reflect both on what you're saying to how do i understand that reflect it back to you to say, is this what you mean? Here's what I'm hearing and let you clarify that. And then, then it may just be true that nobody cares what you know until they know you care. Right. So S H A R allow me to show you that I care. And then you may well care what I have to say at that point. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's not only true in, in relationship and kind of like, counseling somebody or helping somebody, but even in sharing the gospel. Yeah. I mean, you need to hear people first, know where they're coming from. And then once they know that you heard yourself about them, then uh, they may listen to your story as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I've always uh, kind of cringed at the um, sidewalk preacher that's screaming at the cars as they go by. I'm thinking, I, I don't think that's the model Jesus has for us, right? No. Right. Jesus is about relationship. I mean, from the very beginning, God is three persons in one. There's a relationship, right? And they yeah. got created us in his image. And so I think that's why I'm, I'm believing that at the end of uh, life, when people look back over their life and they, if they have any regrets whatsoever, it generally is around, I wish I had spent more time with the people I love. Relationship. It's the most important thing. Not the things I accumulated, not the things I accomplished, not the status or the money or the power or the even the wonderful experiences. I love some people say, I wish I traveled more, which is more of experience, experiential. But ultimately, when your house is on fire, you go in and you get the people out first, and then maybe the pictures, which capture the memories, right, of those people. 
that, that's an indication that relationships are the most important thing. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So by showing up and sharing, by listening, you give people a gift that you care about them. And quite honestly, sometimes we're like this little kid next to their parents who say, look at me. Could you see me, mom? Do you see me, dad? All they're saying is, I want to be seen. I want to be I want to be felt. I want to know that I'm important, right? We, we, we have this gaping hole for validation. And God's like, well, of course you do. I made you. Whoosh! I'll validate you. In fact, so much that I'll send my son, who is sinless, to pay the ultimate price to let you know I love you. And I want you to be in my family. And I'll pay any cost for that. Right? Yeah, that's beautiful. I think God is giving you a word here, Joe. I, I appreciate you sharing, share with me. And I'm glad you do with the basketball guys, too. That's that's really good. Uh, in any context, it, it applies. So, Joe, just a last word for the people. You've spent now much big chunk of your adult life in service to the kingdom of God. Um, based on what you've received, you're you turn around and you give it away. That's that's your job. You're a teacher. You're a pastor. You're a husband. You're a father, a grandfather, all these things. Um, the question I think young people have, I know I did when I was young, is it worth it? Because that sounds like a lot of sacrifice. Where's the return on that investment, Joe? And just talk about now, looking back, was was that worth it and why? Well, it absolutely is. Uh, before I kind of give the final answer to that, I'll say, I'll say this. You know, there are times throughout life when you ask that question yourself. Is this worthwhile? Have I made any difference? Does anybody care? Does God care? Have I wasted my life? So that that's a, a periodic uh, reflection and, and evaluation, uh, sometimes to a point of a faith crisis on occasion through the, the decades. Say, so do I actually believe this? <laughs> Is this real? You know, so I, I want people to know that that's kind of, at least for me, is a, a normal part of uh, the ongoing development and, and life journey. And so not to feel badly about that, I, I give an image of um, all of us go through a desert. Um, we're bound to. Uh, and we may get to a point where we're just crawling. But the, the promise that I give that I think God gives is that there will, there will be an oasis. You, you can die in the desert um, if you just stop. But if you keep on going, you you will find that refreshment and you will be revived. And so even in a time of spiritual questioning and doubt and all those sorts of things, uh, my encouragement is just keep on going. And eventually you will get there. And uh, it's kind of the way it is in reflecting on life. You know, uh, I think about things that, I did well and things I did not do well, sins I've committed, uh, joys that I've accomplished, uh, but all of it's been part of what God molding and making me, and it, it gets worthwhile. And every once in a while, I'll get a, a text or a, an email or a card or somebody's making a, some statement, I think, uh, that just of appreciation. I think, well, thank you, God. I, I needed that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's been worthwhile. So the answer is, Definitely, yes. Awesome. Uh, and I thank God for that because it's all come from him. You know, the at the end of time, how this, this works out, and I know it's probably going to be way beyond what I can imagine, but, you know, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I'm thinking if God's in the ever present now, there's time is linear for us, but not for him. I wonder if God isn't saying to us now through his amazing grace well done, good and faithful servant. Not just because I'm dead and entering into glory, but because every day I'm dying to myself and taking up the cross and following Jesus, as difficult as that may be. And God's saying, I see you. And here's a little note. Well done, good and faithful servant. Keep it up. And then he says, enter into my rest. And again, I keep thinking that's in the future. But God's not in the future. God's in the now. So he's saying, well done. Now rest, right? Let me replenish your soul so you can get up and go again in the next moment, in the next day, in the next month, and whatever it might be. So right. that, that's we can enjoy that reality right now. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Joe, for spending time with me. Uh, I, I've, I've gained a ton from you just uh, watching you from a distance. You, you wouldn't necessarily know that, but I, I'm an observer. 
so not only your profession, but your character. Uh, I know you you faced as many struggles as anybody does, maybe more, you know, less doesn't really matter. It's not a comparison thing. You're human. So life is hard sometimes. You've been through the desert, but you didn't give up. And uh, as the, you know, I think the children of Israel, the, the distance from Egypt to the Promised Land was like a four day trip and they were there for 40 years. <laughs> God got them there and sustained them all along the way. And even said, hey, here's the symbol of what you're doing. Gives them a snake. Who wants a snake when you're in the desert, right? But the snake, the snake sheds its skin so that it can emerge something new, like, like a butterfly, like a bullfrog. It's this, God's showing us everywhere. It's a matter of daily dying and being renewed. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You don't need a resurrection if you haven't died, right? So I am the resurrection and the life every moment, every breath. Breathe it in, breathe it out. Live it, enjoy it, it's for you. And let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we walk daily, help us to call out to you, to see you, to draw us closer to you. Lift our ears and eyes to you, dear Savior of this world, Jesus. If any listening heart present with us today doesn't know you, help that special soul to be drawn to you to be empowered by you. As you open your arms to us, help us to open our hearts to you, Heavenly Father God. Help us to look to you as our guide and helper at all times. We love you and worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we thank you so much for joining us today and we Pray that you go this week in His care.